Okay, Owen, um, I really like your garden here and, and what you're talking about with the sustainability sounds really, really compelling. I've got a pretty big place and I spend most of my time mowing the, the stuff down. How, how, can I, uh, how can I have something like this? It's a good question. I mean, actually, most people totally struggle with their landscapes. They, they see it as a battleground and they don't know what to do to get themselves out of it. And so gardening and maintenance are not that much fun for most people. I call that adversarial horticulture, which means you're basically doing war with your garden to keep it under control. So why is that? Well, one of the principles of sustainable landscaping is what we call, uh, what they call in biology, homeostasis. Homeostasis means that uh, a living system has checks and balances within it to keep it under control, kind of like uh, Congress in theory. Um, although it works a lot better in nature, frankly. And so here's, here's how it works. Um, if, if you have, say, a weed problem, for example, well, why, why do you have those weeds? What caused those weeds to be there? Well, they filled a niche that wasn't being filled by anything else. If you um, take a proactive stance and you fill that niche with a desirable plant, which then shades the ground, takes up the moisture, the nutrients, and the resources that the weeds would otherwise be getting, once that plant is mature, there won't be any weeds in that area. If you expand that out to the whole landscape and you create a living ecosystem that is full of those homeostatic qualities, then you're not going to have to do so much like you're mowing, for example, because you've got a system that's working properly. Most landscapes are not set up as an ecosystem. They're just set up willy-nilly, decorative, um, what I call the Saturday morning syndrome. You go to the nursery, you buy a plant, and, and you come home and you try to find a place to put it. There's no system to it. It doesn't make any sense. By really doing what I call deep design, which is designing a landscape so that it is a living ecosystem, so that it has a homeostatic quality to it in all of its aspects, you're not going to have to fight that landscape so much. Your mowing, your weeding, your pruning are all the result of having a system that isn't working. That's why you're working, because the system is not working. So what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be your work or the work of the landscape itself? It's a simple question. It's not asked enough, and it's not answered very well by most landscapes. So. The question, of course, is, is how do we do it? Well, let's take, for example, pruning. If you're pruning to control the size of a plant, yeah. okay, which we all accept, this is normal. In fact, we accept adversarial horticulture as being normal. This is just what we do. If we have land, we have to fight and struggle and go out every Saturday and work our fingers to the bone, and that's just not true. That's not true at all. So let's talk about pruning for a minute. If you're trying to control the size of a plant, there's a reason for that, and the reason is that plant is too big for the space that it's in. Who picked that plant? Why didn't they pay attention to the ultimate size of the plant at maturity? It's a key question. Let's say you want a six foot tall plant. Don't pick one that gets 30 feet tall and cut it back constantly. Pruning is about directing growth in a very subtle way. You shouldn't have to do very much pruning for most plants. Pick a plant that's the right size, right plant, right place, as they say in horticulture, give it the conditions it needs, and leave it alone. Now this has cost implications as well, because let's say you're actually paying your gardener to prune that plant. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's say we have a five foot tall shrub that the gardener is keeping in typical gardener fashion, unfortunately, sheared into a square or a, or, or a sphere. Or a poodle. Or a poodle or whatever. And it doesn't really even look that good. And, but everybody accepts that. I mean, you see landscapes that are all geometrically sheared. And sometimes there's an art thing that's nice. But mostly that's just done because, wow, these plants are getting too big. Tell the gardener to do something. The gardener gets out the hedge clippers and turns it into massive green geometry. There's really no need for that. Okay? And cost-wise, check this out. If your gardener spends 15 minutes trimming that shrub, and you're paying him, say, $35 an hour, which is about the going rate here for a real professional gardener. Um, you're looking at about $10 with the hauling and the dump fees and whatnot to, to, to manage the size of that plant. You don't just do that one time because you can't train plants like you can train the dog. They're going to continue to try to get big because they have a genetic destiny to do that. That's what they're going to do. So and a month later, you've got to do it again. 
and then a month later you've got to do it again and throughout the entire growing season. For us that's virtually 365 days a year. If you're in a colder climate it's shorter. You're still paying over and over and over again. We calculated here that in Southern California, and of course your mileage will differ depending on where you are, because of our long growing season, if you're trimming a plant 10 times a year and it's costing you $10 per trimming, that's $100 a year. If you do that for 20 years, okay, that's $2,000. $2,000 to prune a plant that might have cost you $20 to put in in the first place. Okay? Now, that's one plant. Let's say you've got 10 of those. Let's say you've got 100 of those. A yard full of plants like that, which a whole lot of people do. Now, you don't notice that all these thousands of dollars are leaving your bank account, slipping out of your pocket for no good reason. Imagine if all of those plants had been the right size and you didn't have to do anything except enjoy them, which is what we're supposed to do. Because when we think of a garden, we think of a beautiful place that's like this, serene, peaceful, calm, beautiful, easy to live with. The reality is that oftentimes we are doing war with our own landscaping. We're fighting it all the time. It's noisy, it's polluting, it's expensive, and it doesn't have to be that way. By choosing sustainable landscaping, by simply doing things right, and that's all that sustainable landscaping is, you, you end run all of those problems. You don't have those problems anymore, and your costs go way down. Okay. Now, does it mean you have zero maintenance? Of course not. There's always some cleanup. There's always a little pruning. There's always a little watering or whatever. There's no such thing as a zero maintenance landscape. If you want that, move to a high rise and let somebody else deal with it. But we can get the cost down and the effort down to a small fraction, usually about a fifth. And this has been proven. And we can talk about this sometime in a real place where they've taken two gardens and compared the two over several years. And the sustainable garden compared to a traditional garden, which is lawn and, and high water use plants and no mulch to keep the weeds down and so forth, the cost difference is about five times, which means the sustainable landscape costs you one fifth of what the traditional landscape costs. There is no reason not to do this, even if you don't like the environment for some reason and you eat spotted owls for breakfast just to be spiteful it doesn't make any difference. Even if you're just a cheapskate, you should do this because it's cheaper. So there's no downside to this whatsoever, and there's so many positives that it just doesn't make sense not to do it. Well, I definitely fall into the cheapskate category. Is there any, any way that we can go about turning our expensive ornamentals into a, a, a food forest? Absolutely. Now, let's, let's talk from the beginning. You've, you've got something now and you feel that it's, let's just talk about cost, although obviously all the other benefits accrue as well. When you start doing things right, and you do them right on all levels, you start getting all the benefits. But just from the standpoint of cost, let's say you're concerned about cost. And you know, we're all cheapskates these days. I mean, let's face it, the economy right now has put a lot of people into the category of cheapskate who might have been spending a lot of money two or three years ago, and that's fine. Um, where do you start? You've got a yard that has a lot of turf. You've got a yard that has a lot of inappropriate plants. They're too big. They use too much water. They, they need constant pest and disease control, constant care. How do you get a grip on this? Well, there's a plan for this. And it's, we call it the bootstrapping plan. And it's starting with the things that are behavioral. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say your water bill is too high. Okay? Of $385 last month. Okay. And it rained. And it rained. Okay. And it, when, as it gets hotter, it's going to be even higher. Mm -hmm. So how much of that water bill is necessary for the plants and how much of it is waste? Well, studies have shown that 50% or more of applied water in a typical residential landscape is wasted. It's unnecessary and it's either wasted through overwatering or through runoff or the water drifting out of sprinkler heads which atomize the water and make it all blow away. Whoa, 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 whoa. Waste, waste, waste. It's everywhere like 60% of residential water goes onto the ground outside. You mean that we're wasting 30% oh. of our, 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 our this, we don't have any? Exactly, exactly. Why and that's not just true, true in Southern California, that's true all over, well, anywhere they garden, all over the United States and all over the world. Why? Because of bad water management, because people simply don't understand how to water, and it's fun to water, right? I mean, it's you get out there a hot day and you stand around with a hose or you turn the sprinklers on. We like everything to be wet. We're not asking the question, what do the plants like? 
That's the question to ask. So let me go back to the saving, saving money thing. Okay. Um, we start with behavioral things like turn that controller down. You know, why is it set to water four times a week? Those plants probably don't need that much water. And that's a really, really important thing. Here's a little trick. Okay. Turn the controller off. Note what day it is. And watch how long it takes before your plants begin to show little signs of stress, that they actually need water. Not when you thought they needed water, which might be at day two or three, but they might go five days, seven days, 10 days, 20 days. They will not just fall over dead instantly because you turned that controller off. People are afraid to do it. Now you wanna keep an eye on things as you do this, but let me tell you something. When you do that, or you t turn the controller down, you begin to learn the actual need, water needs of your plants. Your plants will tell you when they need water. There are signs of, simple signs of drought stress, like leaves curling down, losing a little sheen, not growing quite as much, uh, losing some of the older leaves. Those are the early signs of drought stress, and you can actually see those coming and see that water need coming. And then you can readjust your controller for appropriate watering. That's one simple step. It didn't cost you a penny. If you don't have a controller and you're doing it by hand, simply do it manually. Just back off the watering and watch and see what happens. Didn't cost you a cent. Check your water bill next month. Instead of $385, maybe it'll be $200. Okay, now, this is where the bootstrap thing comes in, okay? okay. You start with that, and let's say you save $100. That's a reasonable thing to expect, given your particular circumstance, because $385 is a lot of money for the, the cool place, you have a big place, but let's cut it back and let's say we just save you $100 okay. every month and that's an average and so that's $1,200 a year. At the end of a year, you've got $1,200 that you didn't have before. It's in your bank account, okay? So instead of going out and spending it on, you know, a, a new car or something, um, put it in the bank, save it up. At the end of the year, you've got enough money there, it's not much, but it's enough to then go to the second stage, which is what we call minor infrastructure changes. What does that mean? Well, let me give you a couple examples. If you have a sprinkler system, an overhead sprinkler system, and it's got little spray heads that shoot up and shoot maybe 15 feet, very typical system, um, you can actually replace the nozzles now with a little mini rotator nozzle that has a much lower, what we call a precipitation rate. And that just means it applies the water more slowly and it's in streams, they're very pretty. They come out and they rotate around and the streams follow each other. It doesn't blow away as easily. The coverage is more uh, even. It's putting the water on more slowly so it's not running off onto the sidewalk and into the street. You're gonna have still further reductions in your water use. So you've spent a little money, maybe you spent a couple hundred dollars on nozzles out of that, that $1,200 that you had. Then maybe you get a smart controller. A smart controller is an automated irrigation controller. It's different from the one that you may have on your property now, which is just a timer, and you set it for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, six in the morning, and these valves come on for a certain amount of time. The smart controller works completely differently, and here's how it works. It actually gets signals from a weather station, which could either be up on the eaves of your house or somewhere else on the property, or it could actually be a community weather station that's sending signals to a central computer, then that's a, that set of weather station signals is translated into a watering program that's, believe it or not, is beamed up to a satellite and is downlinked to your controller, which has a little antenna on it. This is real space age stuff, watering from outer space, and it reduces water use by 25, 50% or more in some cases. What that means is you're gonna spend a few hundred dollars on this controller, and now your water bills are gonna come down still further. So these are examples of, of second stage minor infrastructure changes. Now, you're gonna bank that money again for a year or two, and it's gonna to start to bootstrap or pay up uh, a way to make more ambitious changes, like maybe reducing your lawn area or getting rid of your lawn entirely, or doing something with those areas that you're mowing and weed whacking now, put them in production, get some food tree, fruit trees growing, um, get something going there that will take up the water, sunlight, and nutrients that are now being used to grow weeds, and all of a sudden, you're really now rocking with a beautiful new landscape. It hasn't cost you anything if you're willing to just wait it out and bootstrap it through on these changes. So even if you're not only a cheapskate, but you're broke, you can still do this step by step slowly and it pays off in the long run and everything you do creates more payoff. 
And we're just talking money, but there's a whole lot more to it. Obviously, the environmental benefits, um, the birds and the bees will love it. The water district will love it because you're not using as much water. Your family's going to love it because you're getting food out of it. Maybe you're planting native plants, and so the, it becomes habitat for wildlife. There's so many other benefits to sustainable landscaping. You're getting all of them in one place because when you start to do things right, as I say, the benefits go through the whole system. Yes, yes.